invented yet. Uh, one of the features or flaws, depending on how you want to look at it, is inside the action of a harp support, the string is actually plucked. And so it leads to an instant decay of sound. So in order for the harp support to remain sounding and relevant during a piece written with harp support, more and more notes are needed so that you can actually hear it because of the diminishment of the sound. This changed in 1710, when Bach was about 25 years old. And in Florence, Italy, a man named Bartolomeo Cristofori invented what we now know as the piano. And he, like many other musicians at the time, were a little bit frustrated that there was that instant decay of sound and a lack of ability to control volume. And so he said, I'm going to do something about this. And invented what he called the Arpicemolo col piano e forte, a harp harpsichord that plays loud and strong. And what he did <laughs> was instead of the plucking action inside, he added a mechanism and a lever with a hammer that would strike the string from below. This allowed the string to continue to reverberate and then be able to change the volume, which also completely changed music. In our next piece, the Mozart Herschel 296, uh, Mozart, who was born six years after Bach's death, is writing for this new instrument as it sweeps across Europe and takes over as the predominant keyboard instrument. As Mozart is writing, and as we move further in time, we get into what we know now as the classical era and the music written in the Age of Enlightenment. We have a changing of philosophy and science, literature, and also music. After the contrapuntal and polyphonic style that was mostly predominant in the Baroque, we move to a homophonic style in the classical, where you have a single melody line with an accompaniment underneath in the form of a bass line or a completely separate part, and the parts are less interwoven. This sonata in particular is a, a fine example of that. You're going to hear a clearer delineation of lines, and you're going to see the beauty and the genius that is the music. Thank you. 
still in the classical era, um, is the man of the hour, Ludwig von Beethoven. And uh, through this concert, and maybe in hopefully future concerts this year, we are attempting to celebrate his 250th birthday. 
Uh, he was baptized roughly on December 17th, 1770. So last December was the beginning of his 250th birthday. So happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> um, Beethoven, as many of you know, stands alone as a titan of composition and music. And though he was born partially deaf and then eventually became completely deaf before he died, managed to write some of the most beloved and famous and awe-inspiring music in history. Um, by the time Beethoven is writing this sonata, the piano goes through another little bit of a bass lift. We add about two and a half octaves more of range to the instrument, so we're adding more keys lower and higher. Uh, the metal hammers from the Cristofori piano are now no longer covered in leather but of felt. And we also are adding uh, metal barriers to help reinforce the new stronger tension strings inside. So the piano and the instruments, again, that Beethoven is using and writing and performing on are already different from Mozart's as more technology advances for our instruments. And Beethoven not only helps to facilitate this himself, but uses it in all of his compositions. And throughout the course of his writing history, demands more from the performers, from the instruments, and from music. And he was always the composer that was pushing the envelope with everything. And acts as a bridge composer between historically the classical and beginning of the Romantic era, as he is uh, dying in 1827. In this sonata, which we will perform in its entirety, all three movements, you will hear an even broader dynamic range, more virtuosic writing for the violin and for the piano, more emotion, more, more everything, really. <laughs> and uh, so we have the first movement, Allegro con Brio, a very beautiful set of theme and variations in the second movement, and a nice light rondo to finish for the third. So I hope you enjoy this day so <clears throat>
Sonata in A Major, Opus 100, by Johannes Brahms. Brahms is born six years after Beethoven's death and lives until 1897. So he actually lives through most of what we call the Romantic Era, which Beethoven ushers in. And Brahms is living at the same time as composers like Dvorak, Tchaikovsky, Strauss, and Wagner. And as we move through the 19th century, a lot of the old traditions and norms don't get completely thrown out the window, but they definitely get updated in the form of the tone poem over the symphony and things like that. So the traditional forms, chord progressions, expectations, phrasing, all of that gets embellished and embellished and amped up. And the process of musical evolution continues further. Brahms holds back a little bit in his own writing and pays homage to composers like Beethoven. It famously took him 18 years to finish his first symphony because he was afraid it would not receive the same uh, critical acclaim and instead be judged because of symphonies the way Beethoven used to write. So he had a foot in each door a little bit mentally and musically in the classical and the romantic eras. He does take a little bit more of the romantic playbook in this particular sonata 
Uh, it's titled Allegro Amabile as opposed to traditional Allegro. So fast and joyful in a loving fashion. And you hear a lot more lyricism in the melodies, both in the piano and the violin. And uh, it also doesn't use as the theme, as the other three sonatas did, a basis off of a single arpeggio. Mm. So in the Bach, from the beginning, you get the concept of the piece around your G major arpeggio. In the Mozart, the same thing. Built around the C major arpeggio, and in the Beethoven, in the first movement in particular, also built around the tonic key of the piece, the D major arpeggio. In the Brahms, you're gonna hear, I'll give you a little sneak peek. <laughs> So it has nothing to do with a particular triad. And in this way, you can hear a lot of 19th century coming out in this piece. And so it does stand alone as a romantic sonata and just as beautiful as the other three. So here's some problems for you.
our journey of German sonatas and uh, because you guys were so good and had all your meat and potatoes you're gonna get some flan for dessert <laughs> closing the program we have the Hulta by Manuel Defaya and Defaya was a late 19th century romantic 20th century uh, Spanish composer and he wrote in a very folky Spanish nationalistic style he also spent some time composing and collaborating in France with composers like Debussy and Ravel, but always wrote in a true Spanish form. And the Jota is the sixth of a series of seven dances in a collection that he calls the Siete Canciones Populares, and it's really fun. And I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you. 